Now that almost everybody is back, uh, and we expect others to join us very quickly, we're going to move on to panel three. The speakers in panel three are Dr. Jennifer Lowry from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Welcome. Mr. Patrick Morrison from the International Association of uh, Firefighters. Welcome to you, sir. Uh, Mr. Louis Torres, League of United Latin American <laughs> Citizens. Um, Ms. Maureen Swanson from the Learning Disabilities Association of America. And Mr. Daniel Pencina, who I understand is en route. So uh, in the meantime, you will each have five minutes to present testimony. And may I ask you to look behind the commissioners to the gentleman with the yellow time card so that you can keep track of your time. OK. Uh, Dr. Lowry. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. My name is Dr. Jennifer Lowry, and I am here representing the American Academy of Pediatrics, a nonprofit professional organization of 64,000 pediatricians. I serve as the chair of the AAP's Council on Environmental Health Executive Committee. In addition to my role at the AAP, I also work at Children's Mercy Kansas City, where I am the chief of the section of clinical toxicology, the medical director of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology, Medical Toxicology, and Therapeutic Innovation, and the medical director of the Center for Environmental Health. I appreciate the opportunity to provide input today. The AAP is one of the original petitioners and strongly supports the CPSC moving forward on this important child health issue to ban the use of organohalogen flame retardants in children's products, upholstered furniture, mattresses and mattress pads, and the plastic casings of electronic devices. Organohalogen flame retardants have a well-documented association with significant deleterious child health effects and are extensively used in these four product classes. These chemicals are known to leach from those products, resulting in widespread human exposure. CPSC is well positioned to act on this public health threat through its FHSA authority, and we urge you to move forward and develop a proposed rule to ban this chemical class in these four product categories. Not only do children have more opportunities to be exposed to environmental chemicals, but as children grow and mature, their unique physiologic, developmental, and behavioral differences make them especially vulnerable to chemical exposures. Because children are smaller than adults, their surface area to body mass ratio is greater. Children eat more food and drink more water per unit of body weight than do adults, and they breathe at a faster rate. Infants and children of all ages spend more time on the floor or ground than adults. Therefore, children will come into more contact with contaminants on these surfaces. Chemical exposures can disrupt the critical and rapid stages of development that occur in prenatal and early childhood life exposures, particularly those involving the neurologic and endocrine systems. Organo organohalogen flame retardants are associated with a wide range of serious adverse health effects, including reproductive impairment, neurological effects including IQ decrements and learning deficits, endocrine disruption, and interference with thyroid hormone action, genotoxicity, cancer, and immune disorders. Children exposed to these chemicals can face serious and irreversible health consequences, and banning these flame retardants will help to prevent these adverse health effects in children. In addition to the extensive evidence for the detrimental health effects these chemicals pose to children, the CDC's biomonitoring program estimates that 97% of U.S. residents have measurable quantities of these chemicals in their blood. Further, the highest level of harmful flame retardants in the general population are found in young children from communities of low socioeconomic status and communities of color, and especially in children under the age of 12, with the majority of them being under the age of 5. Flame retardant exposure is ubiquitous in the U.S., presenting a serious public health threat to children. In fact, these chemicals have been found in human breast milk, which can be the sole source of nutrition for many infants. Given the documented health threat these chemicals pose and the evidence of significant exposure, action is critical. The child health risks risk these chemicals pose are all the more troubling given that they are not necessary for products to meet any mandatory flamm flammability standard. Most fire deaths and injuries result from inhaling carbon monoxide, irritant gases, and soot. The incorporation of organohalogen flame retardants can increase the yield of the toxic byproducts during combustion. Thus, the risks of these chemical class far outweigh their intended benefit, and organohalogen flame retardants are unnecessary to protect against fires and instead pose their own serious risks to children. 
An FHA span, FHSA ban of this entire chemical class in all four product categories is necessary because history and extensive scientific research demonstrate that the health threats from these chemicals are present across the chemical class. Warning labels are insufficient to protect children and families from the risk flame retardants pose. Previous attempts to address the health effects of flame retardants on a chemical by chemical basis led to regrettable substitution, whereby the banning of one problematic compound led to the adoption across the industry of a chemical with simil similar health risks, but less available research demonstrating them. The AAP strongly supports this petition, and we urge you to expeditiously put <coughs> forward a proposed rule to address this child health threat. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and the AAP looks forward, as, I, as well do I do, look forward to working with you on this important issue. Thank you very much. Mr. Morrison. Good morning, Commissioners, and thank you for allowing the International Association of Firefighters to testify before the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission on the petition requesting rulemaking of the product containing organohalogen flame retardants. I'm Patrick Morrison with the International Association of Fire firefighters and I'm with the health and safety and medicine for that organization. The IFF is an international union that represents over 300,000 paid professional service employees in the United States and Canada. The IFF has been actively involved in proving health and safety for firefighters for more than 90 years. This is a critical activity for the workforce and in, in which fatalities and early retirement due to work-related injuries and illnesses occur regularly. Firefighters dying from occupational-related cancer, cancers now account for more than half of our members' line of duty death. This is the largest health-related issue facing the firefighter profession. We must reduce this number in removing toxic flame retardants in products as a positive step forward in protecting first responders from the harmful effects of these toxic flame retardants. In the vast majority of the U.S. workplaces, occupational exposure levels have greatly declined in the past two to three decades. Improved workplace conditions can be attributed to the many factors, including governmental, occupational safety, and health agencies, legislation, training, programs for occupational health professionals, and good business practices include the need to keep highly skilled workers healthy and working. Unfortunately, firefighters have not benefited from a lot of these improvements. They are still entering uncontrolled, hazardous environments regularly. A study has shown that firefighters have higher levels of flame retardant chemicals in their body than the general population. Firefighters come into contact with toxic flame retardants in their daily lives just like the rest of the population. But firefighters have a much higher risk of suffering the negative cancer-causing effects of our carcinogenic flame retardants as those chemicals burn in fire, whether it is the air they breathe, exposure during the overhaul of the fire, the absorption through their skin during and working at that fire, or after the incident as they expose to the toxic soot that covers their turnouts and equipment. It is the IFF's position that this exposure contributes to the reason that our members have a significantly higher incident rate of certain types of cancers. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, recently conducted a landmark study of cancer among U.S. firefighters that included data from over 30,000 career firefighters employed from 1950 to 2010. The research found that firefighters compared to the general population has statistically significant increases in both diagnosis and death from certain cancers. The IFF supports banning the use of toxic flame retardants that are known to or found to be <coughs> carcinogen, carcinogens that contribute to cancer and have additionally negative effects on the health of our members. Giving this increasing body of evidence that indicates this persistence, bioaccumulation, and potential health concerns of these flame re fire retardants, we believe the health risk associated with the use of these chemicals is greater than the fire risk without using these chemicals. This is even more factual with the use of advanced fire safety technology that is in place today to include sprinkler systems, smoke and fire detection systems, and mo modern early warning devices. In addition, it is widely known that there has been a significant reduction in the use of tobacco products across the United States, which has contributed to the reduction of fires across the, across the U.S. There are two key ways to impact the use of toxic flame retardants in products. One is through the standard setting process. Since flame retardant chemicals are commonly used as means of complying with these test requirements. The other is through regulation of chemicals themselves by banning or restricting the use of specific flame retardants. These strategies can be most effective in combination 
since restricting use of one hazard flame retardant cannot guarantee the future flame retardants will be safe for human and environmental health. On a standard setting front, one of the most broad based reforms that has been uh, the adoption of the smoldering standard TB 117 2013. We strongly at the IAFF support the change to this TB 1117 2013, which now creates a toxic free fire safety option. This new testing option mirrors today's fire safety problems using utilizing barriers to slow the spread of, of a smoldering fire. However, there is an effort on the horizon at the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, that could potentially impact this modern toxic free um, option. We are concerned with the approach to this being taken at the NFPA to create a new open flame standard. The main task group that is working on the draft standards moving towards proposing a doctrine of TB133, a large open flame that could require the application of an increased use of flame retardants in residential upholstered furniture. The IFF has one representative on this task committee. This committee has been developing a draft titled NFPA 277, method, Standard Methods of Test for Evaluating Fire and Ignition Resistance Upholstered Furniture Using an Existing Source. Mr. Source. Morrison, your time has expired. I'm going to yield an additional 30 seconds to We've you to that. finish your testimony thank out, of, you. out of my th time. No, thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Um, we very much hope the Commissioner grant this petition to ban the additive organohaligans in the consumer products which have been a broad impact on firefighters and the public across the United States. In closing, over the years, deceptive practices and misuse of data by companies that produce toxic flame retardants have misled the public in the name of fire safety. The IFF will continue to fight for the elimination of these toxic chemicals. I thank the com Commissioner for allowing first responders to have a voice in protecting our job environment while still maintaining the highest level of protection for the citizens we protect every day. And thank you, Commissioner, for that extended time. Thank you so much, Mr. Torres. Welcome. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Luis Torres, and I'm the Director of Policy for the League of United Latin American Citizens. We are the oldest and largest Latino civil rights organization in the country. We were founded in 1929. We have volunteer members in 37 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Now, in July of 2009, thousands of our members gathered uh, to vote and adopt a, an environmental justice resolution. The resolution asserts that Latino communities in the United States have a right to be safe from harmful exposure, a right to prevention, a right to know what we're exposed to, a right to participate in decision-making processes that have implications on our community, and a right to protection and enforcement of policies that promote and safeguard the well-being of workers, families, and our communities. Now, I sit here before you today, not just on behalf of LULAC, but on behalf of the 54 million Latino Hispanic families who are concerned about toxic chemicals. Now, as an organization that advances the economic condition, educational attainment, political influence, housing, health, and civil rights of Hispanic Americans, we are increasingly concerned about exposure to toxic chemicals and its impact on the health of our communities. Now, this time, we are dealing with an invisible and what we feel is an insidious assailant that threatens the sanctuary that is our home and hinders our community's ability to defend itself. Now, you've heard from other uh, panelists that the science indicates that the highest human levels of harmful flame retardant chemicals in the general <coughs> population have been found in young children from low-income communities <coughs> and from communities of color. In particular, the 2003-2004 National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey conducted by the CDC found that at least one form of organohalogen flame retardants in 97% of the participants. This biometric study also showed that Mexican Americans and non-Hispanic blacks had higher levels of flame retardants than their non-Hispanic non white counterparts. Teenagers ages 12 to 19 had higher body burdens than adults for all flame retardants measured. What we know is that exposure to organohalogen flame retardant chemicals can lead to serious health concerns such as reduced IQ, disruption of hormones, cancer, and reproductive impairments. These exposures threaten the health and educational attainment of our children, and in doing so, their prospects for the future and economic condition. Now, a 2012 study of Mexican-American children in the state of California found that children who lived in areas with limited access to safe <coughs> outdoor play spaces tend to have higher levels of toxic flame retardant chemicals in their blood. Now, nearly half, 45 percent, 
of the nation's Latino population lives in 10 metropolitan areas. When you consider that urban areas where nearly half of our community lives and combine that with findings that show that racial and ethnic minorities and low-income people have less access to green spaces than their, non their non-Hispanic counterparts, what that signals to us is that minority and low-income children are spending more time indoors. Instead of being safe, they're being exposed to flame retardant chemicals and toxic chemicals. Now, if we continue to allow toxic flame retardant chemicals to invade our home, we're deluding Latinos and all families into believing that we are safe in our home and on equal footing as those who can afford to live in green and purchase their way out of exposure to these toxic products. Now, this is not, a lot, not an option for a lot of Latinos whose medium annual personal income is 21000 and the medium household income is 41000 Latinos also have the highest uninsured rate of any ethnic or racial group. When you take into account the economic status with health insurance coverage, you begin to imagine how our community is already limited in its ability to protect itself from these chemicals. Our families shouldn't have to worry about flame retardant chemicals off-gassing from children's products, furniture, mattresses, and the casings around electronics into our homes, entering our bodies and polluting our children. When you look at our demographics and the range of socioeconomic factors affecting us, I am hopeful that I've provided you with a deeper understanding of our community and the sense of urgency that I feel as I sit before you today. Our members have submitted public comments on this petition, and I've done my part as well. Now it's up to you, and I hope that you will use the power that you have uh, to take swift action and ban these harmful and pervasive chemicals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Swanson. Thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to comment. My name is Maureen Swanson, and I direct the Healthy Children Project for the Learning Disabilities Association of America. LDA is the oldest and largest national volunteer organization advocating for children and adults with learning disabilities, with chapters in more than 40 states. Our members are teachers, parents, health professionals, and people with learning disabilities. We are also submitting written comments in support of the proposed rule with our partner organizations, including the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, the Autism Society of America, and the ARC. We are witnessing an alarming increase in neurodevelopmental disorders that cannot be fully explained by changes in awareness or diagnosis. One in six children in the United States has a reported developmental disability, including autism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and other learning and developmental delays. In 2000, the National Academy of Sciences stated that environmental factors, including exposures to toxic chemicals in combination with genetics, contribute to at least a quarter of all neurodevelopmental disorders in the U.S. In the 15 years since that NAS report, scientific evidence linking toxic chemical exposures and neurodevelopmental disorders has reached a critical mass. Mounting scientific evidence clearly demonstrates that babies and young children are regularly exposed to halogenated flame retardants and that those exposures pose an unreasonable risk of serious and lasting harm to brain development. Halogenated flame retardants cross the placenta to the fetus and are detected in umbilical cord blood and in breast milk. These chemicals migrate from furniture, electronics enclosures, mattresses, and baby products into dust and are ingested by young children. A 2011 study of baby products found that 80% of the items tested contained halogenated flame retardants. A 2014 study of 40 daycares and preschools in California found halogenated flame retardants in 100% of dust samples at the facilities. What do these constant exposures to halogenated flame retardants mean for the fetus and young children? The science on polybrominated diphenyl ethers and neurodevelopment answers that question. In the last five years, three separate studies of hundreds of pregnant women and children have resulted in strikingly similar findings. Children more highly exposed prenatally to PBDEs have lower IQ scores, cognitive delays, and attention problems. The decrements in IQ scores persist throughout the children's school years. Many halogenated flame retardants are structurally similar to thyroid hormones, which are essential to healthy brain development. Earlier this year, scientists with the Endocrine Society concluded that PBDE exposures interfere with thyroid hormones. Recent studies of halogenated flame retardants that have replaced PBDEs show that these chemicals also can disrupt thyroid. In plain English, this class of chemicals alters babies' brains. 
I'd like to briefly highlight two replacement halogenated flame retardants that present increasing concerns to brain development. In the late 1970s, TDCPP was one of several halogenated tris flame retardants banned from children's pajamas in light of grave risks to health. Instead of halting production and use of TDCPP, manufacturers instead added this toxic chemical to other children's products, mattresses and furniture. A recent study found that TDCPP was the most commonly detected flame retardant in baby products containing polyurethane foam. In 2011, scientists found that TDCPP and other tris flame retardants may affect neurodevelopment with similar or greater potency than chemicals already known or suspected to be neurotoxic. Firemaster 550 is the second most commonly detected flame retardant in polyurethane foam. It's used in furniture and baby products, including nursing pillows and changing pads. Two of its main components, TBB and DBPH, are brominated compounds and high production volume chemicals that migrate into house dust. In 2012, research implicated Firemaster 550 as an endocrine disrupting chemical at very low exposure levels. The study suggests that Firemaster 550 disrupts thyroid and may harm the developing brain. As an advocate for children and adults with learning and developmental disabilities, and as a parent, I cannot imagine why we would allow this class of toxic chemicals to continue to be manufactured and used in products. Halogenated flame retardants look like PCBs and dioxins. They are similar to known neurotoxins. Their main mode of action is thyroid hormone disruption, and some halogenated flame retardants are also directly neurotoxic. In conclusion, restricting a few flame retardant chemicals at a time is a failed approach that results in unreasonable and increased risks to children's health and development. We urge the Commission to issue the proposed rule and end the cycle whereby chemical makers replace one halogenated flame retardant with another. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Pencina. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Daniel Pencina. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Breast Cancer Fund in support of the petition to ban the sale of four categories of consumer products if they contain non-polymeric additive organohalogen flame retardants. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. <clears throat> breast Cancer Fund is a national nonprofit organization committed to preventing breast cancer by reducing exposure to chemicals and radiation linked to the disease. Today, an astonishing one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime, a number that has risen significantly in the past four decades. We base our policy work on a foundation of sound, peer-reviewed science, showing increased risk of breast cancer from exposure to chemicals, including carcinogens and endocrine disrupting compounds. The Breast Cancer Fund has long advocated for the removal of phthalates from toys and child, ar child care articles based on the science showing the links to numerous negative health impacts. Organohalogen flame retardants raise many of these same concerns. This class of chemicals has been associated with serious health problems including cancer, cognitive and behavioral changes, reproductive impairments, and endocrine disruption. Studies show that flame retardants migrate out of products into our homes and ultimately into our bodies. One class of organohenic, excuse me, organohalogen flame retardants, PBDEs, has been used extensively in both consumer products and industrial products. And although PBDEs have been banned in the EU and have not been produced in the U.S. since 2004, products containing them remain throughout the world. Due to their persistent nature, PBDEs are found ubiquitously in the environment and are detected in the air, dust, soil, food, wildlife, and in humans. A 2003-2004 CDC biomonitoring study uh, demonstrated that 97% of the study participants were exposed to at least one PBDE. Organohalogen flame retardants are endocrine disrupting compounds, exerting effects on a number of hormonal systems including androgens, progestins, and estrogens. The major system affected by PBDEs, the thyroid hormone, has a prominent role in regulating brain development. And as you've heard from many of my fellow presenters, um, uh, research has also shown that exposure to PBDEs can promote breast cancer cell growth and interrupt the action of tamoxifen, a breast cancer treatment drug. As the use of PBDEs has declined, chemicals used as substitutes, including Firemaster 550, are increasingly contaminating our environment. Emerging research is raising serious concerns about the toxicity of Firemaster 550. Firefighters are particularly at risk of exposure to flame retardant chemicals, and biomonitoring studies have found extremely high levels in firefighters. 
Faced with concerns about multiple cases of premenopausal breast cancer among their ranks, San Francisco female firefighters have partnered with scientists, advocates, including the Breast Cancer Fund, uh, to study women's to study women firefighters' exposure to organohalogen flame retardants and other chemicals linked to breast cancer. Another study found that more, more than two-and-a-half-fold increase in breast cancer risk among women firefighters aged 50 to 55. And research also suggests a slightly elevated risk for male breast cancer. The most effective way to protect first responders is to remove these chemicals from products in the homes they fight to save. The strong science showing the toxicity of organohalogen flame retardants provides a solid scientific basis for the Commission to act to ban the cell of these chemicals in these product categories. The Commission should not rely on the EPA to take action under the Toxic Substances Control Act. TSCA has long been acknowledged as failing to protect the public health. Even in the few cases where the EPA has initiated safety reviews of specific chemicals, the chemical industry has been extremely adept at delaying any final action, sometimes for decades. The health of the American public and the children being exposed to organohalogen flame retardants today cannot wait for this unworkable system. The continued sale of household products made with these chemicals place women, children, firefighters, and other vulnerable populations at risk of breast cancer and numerous other negative health impacts. The Breast Cancer Fund strongly urges the Commission to act now to ban the sale of, these consumer, of consumer products covered by this petition that contain dangerous and ineffective organohalogen flame retardants. Thank you for the opportunity to comment to you this morning. Thank you so much, and thanks to all the members of the panel. Um, Mr. Morrison, uh, if I might start with you. First of all, let me just say on behalf of what I'm sure is a grateful nation and also my fellow colleagues, I want to thank the firefighters for the wonderful contribution they make and for the incredible dangers they face every day. So thank you for the wonderful job that you, you do. Uh, what's fascinating to me is that you're a firefighter. So one would, in the abstract, think that you would say the more FR chemicals in products, the better, because that would be more protective to consumers and more protective of firefighters. And yet I hear you saying what seems to be the exact opposite, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on just why you think it is that we don't need FR chemicals in so many products in homes and why you think it's so useful and important for firefighters uh, to protect them by not having these FR chemicals. Right. I, I think what you, what you heard me state was the uh, toxic and the carcinogenic uh, flame retardants in there is what I, I stated. If we could find a substance that you could put in there that could retard the fire, absolutely firefighters would be all for that. But given the fact of the information and how the additives are put in there and the toxicity on that, it's really the cost-benefit analysis on this right now. And I think right now it's costing more of our lives than it is uh, protecting the lives that we have. Um, and I'm probably asking you to speculate, but would you say the same thing with respect to consumers as opposed to firefighters regarding the FR chemicals? A absolutely. I think the statistics that you see, uh, Commissioner, um, with the reduction in fire deaths have come, as I stated in my testimony, from uh, smoke, uh, smoke detectors, smoke alarms, uh, sprinkler buildings, fire prevention uh, programs. So we've seen a, a drastic uh, a decrease in those deaths because of those programs. Do other people use those same statistics to support uh, toxic flame retardants, and I think that is uh, misrepresentation of the information. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Lowry, uh, you state that children are disproportionately vulnerable to toxic chemicals, and I'm wondering where these organohalogens fit into the notion of toxic chemicals. Do they, are they as uh, dangerous as other toxic chemicals, uh, equally dangerous or somewhat more dangerous, just putting it in, into a context of relative priority? Um. I, I think it's more about um, the exposure. I mean, obviously, I'm also a medical toxicologist, so we think about the acute high exposures in poison control centers, and, and that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about those low-level exposures where um, we have the science that Dr. Birnbaum actually spoke to where those low-level exposures occur. Um, kids, children are more highly vulnerable just because of the high amount that these chemicals have in dust. Um, organohalogen flame retardants are one of them. Um, and, and there have been association studies that state that they cause risk. Um, in order, I, I don't necessarily think I can put it like, this is more important than that is more important. And I think all no, chemicals should, right, we would love yeah. to be able to do that, right? 
Um, I know you're looking at phthalates in it, so it's a kind of along that same line. All of them are endocrine disruptors, and I think that if we, more importantly, I can look at the risk and benefit, and if the there is no benefit and there's actually risk, then I think that puts it maybe a little bit higher on than if there's so much more benefit and no risk. Um, but we just know that there's really no benefit to these chemicals, and so why put the children at risk? Ms. Swanson, you made an interesting observation that I just, I think I understand, but I'd like to pin down a little bit more. You say we are in witnessing an alarming increase in neurodevelopmental disorders that cannot be fully explained by changes in awareness or diagnosis, which I take to mean that the risk is growing, but could you expand on that point just a little bit to help me understand? So that does mean that children are in, at increased risk of neurodevelopmental disorders in part because of increased exposures to toxic chemicals like halogenated flame retardants. Um, so there have been some studies showing that while changes in awareness and different diagnostic criteria are uh, responsible for some of the increase in diagnosis of neurodevelopmental disorders, there's a a large portion of that increase that is not explained by those factors and that represents, the scientists say, a, a true increase um, in autism and ADHD. Yeah, that's such an important point because if people are more worried about something, they may tend to see it, but mm -hmm. you're saying setting all that aside or even factoring that in, we seem to have an increasing problem. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Commissioner Adler, and thank you to all of you for coming in today. We really, really appreciate this. This is a critically important area for us to hear your testimony on. Um, a couple of follow-up questions, um, Mr. Morrison. I want to ask you. Uh, you were you were talking about the, the what you attribute the decrease in fire deaths to, but I'd like to just have you comment on one more limitation that we have in this petition, and that is with respect to these four product areas. Um, and that is children's products, outer casings of electronics, mattresses, and residential furniture. Do you have any reason to think that taking this category of flame retardant out of those four product lines will in any way affect safety? No, no, I don't. I think that there are ways, especially what we've seen so far, especially in the, fu in the furniture, uh, different ways that you can use uh, barrier methods to protect without using those chemicals in, in the furniture, and that's one of the biggest exposures that we're seeing in the fire service. We don't see that. We, we, we do not see that we're going to have an increase, and that would, would, you know, would be the big panic that if you take this out, more people are going to die from the lack of these uh, flame retardants. That's not what we right. see, and we think that the, the use of uh, the data that they are using are skewed toward ma making you think of that. Okay. And you've told us the heartbreaking statistics with respect to the firefighters and first responders with respect to the toxicity. Could, could you just quickly comment on what it is about those chemicals and fire that make them so toxic to the first responders and well, firefighters? Well, it, it, it's just the, the nature of our job of uh, firefighting itself. When you're in that environment, people think that we have this protective ensemble that's going to protect us and we're not going to be exposed. The exposure is through the, that smoke and that soot and the, and the products in that soot lay onto our skins. And it is the latest studies that we've had, and we have four recent landmark studies, really look at the absorption rate. So if you heard from the other panelists, we are extremely concerned that that absorption rate with the firefighters at a much higher level than the general population, and we get it, we are the general population also, that increase is the, is the, the factor that we're are truly concerned with on the, on the uh, cancers that are increasing every year. Okay. And just quickly, Dr. Lowry and, and Ms. Swanson have spoken to the effects on children, but Dr. Lowry, could you just quickly um, just amplify on what you said in response to Commissioner Adler's question that children have a higher susceptibility to dust? Why is that physiologically? Largely because when you're born, you're not done, okay? So I think we know that, right? So Some of us aren't going to be done. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a whole other discussion, isn't it? Um, so the, the brain growth is actually more prominent in the first three years of life, five years, but predominantly in the first three years. So there's high amount of high end of mouth um, um, activity. Um, children are lower to the ground, so they're more exposed to this dust. And I think if you look at the data from the CDC and the NHANES, the majority of those PBDEs by far are in children uh, one year old and or uh, less than three. Um, and so because of the high amount of it, when it gets back to um, Commissioner Adler's discussion, they have much higher exposure and they're not done. 
And so any, and they have, um, uh, the blood-brain barrier is not finished, and so they have more ability for these chemicals to actually get into the brain and cause the harm. And so um, it puts them at added risk. Thank you. Mr. Torres, I'd like to follow up just for a moment on your testimony about with respect to your specific community, the Hispanic community, and what we found with respect to the underserved communities. You talked a bit about the underserved communities and living in urban areas, specifically the, the Hispanic population, and not having access to green spaces. Um, and I don't want you to speculate too much, but do you have, we do have statistics, I know, that show that the underserved communities are affected more by the toxicity. Um, of the of the dust, but do you have um, further um, information as to why it is that those communities have higher level of flame retardants in their children and in, in particularly pregnant mothers, I suppose? Right, and I think we we do have some information on that. Um, there's uh, low income populations may also face disparate high exposures to, to due to the presence of older or deteriorated or poorly manufactured furniture in these homes. Many of these families can't just buy themselves out and get rid of this furniture. It's cost prohibited. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a problem because they're getting exposed at higher rates. There are less spaces for them to go, alternate alternative spaces. If you can't go to your home without being exposed, then where can you go? And I think that's uh, a huge issue for us, and m it makes it a civil rights issue because our folks at, at that point, they don't have a safe space to raise their children like everybody else. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Thank you very much. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was going to single out Mr. Morrison and thank him for your service and the industry and the profession service and being first responders. But each one of you at the table have a unique and valuable perspective for us. And so I do want to thank all of you for being here. It's critically important that we hear your testimony today. Um, the only question I have is for Mr. Morrison. So given the fact that uh, this exposure to firefighters occurs in the workplace. Does OSHA have any authority to address this issue, and could they help out here? Um, yeah, we, we would love for OSHA to have something. We're actually working um, with NACOS right now on a panel rulemaking to, to get that protection uh, to the firefighters. Uh, we, are, uh, we work for the uh, public in that domain, and a lot of firefighters aren't covered under the, uh, the OSHA um, regulations and the laws. We're, we're working on, on changing that. But on the fire ground itself, we do not have that protection of the level of exposures to firefighters in an OSHA standard that would allow us to really address this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to also echo the comments made so eloquently by my colleague, Commissioner Burkle, to the whole panel. Uh, Mr. Morrison, I have a question uh, for you with regards to your testimony <coughs> and the concern of these chemicals and the, uh, the possible carcinogenic effects of them on uh, your association and firefighters in general. If the CPSC moved forward with rulemaking and was able to make a finding of toxicity, uh, but not based on uh, on the chemicals potential to be a carcinogen, but based on other elements of toxicity as mentioned by other me members of the panel, either a mutagen or a reproductive toxin or uh, the other kind of um, uh, impacts, would, would you still support the, uh, the agency moving forward? Uh, yes, we would. I mean, uh, that, uh, obviously, uh, what we're looking at is a reduction of those toxic chemicals and exposure for us. I mean, that is our primary uh, reason to be here in front of the commission. So we, we, we're looking at this and knowing that they are carcinogenic. I mean, that's the, that's the problem is that this group, we're just trying to reduce that exposure. For us as firefighters, mm -hmm. Um, that's the only way that we know we're going to be able to combat the increase in the cancer is to do that in a lot of different ways. It's not just in this, in this one little um, area that we're addressing, but this one little area really is significantly, for us anyway, is significantly um, uh, alarming for us and on the rates that we're yeah. Mr. Morrison, would you also support CPSC adopting TB 11713 as a national mandatory standard for upholstered furniture? I would love for the commission to adopt TB 11713. Thank you very Thank much. You. Mr. Torres, uh, uh, as Commissioner Robinson was, I was very interested in, in your testimony and the concern for the disproportionate representation of 
communities of color, as mentioned in a previous panel, but with your association and uh, Hispanics and Latin American, um, uh, Latin American children and the, the California study that you cited in your, uh, in your testimony. Uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned the availability of open spaces. And uh, in, in evaluating that California study, were you familiar whether or not they evaluated um, uh, children not of color living in uh, urban populations and whether or not they also, I'm trying to understand whether or not we've got a correlation or a causation situation uh, and whether it's race-based or, or, or based principally upon uh, where, where children are being raised, whether it's in a uh, urban environment or in a more rural environment, and California being what it is, and with the association and Hispanics being in, uh, in very many uh, rural uh, areas of California as well as urban. Uh, was there a difference between, uh, was there any differences you might be able to um, relate to the commission here? I think I'd have to get back to you on the causation correlation uh, point, but the the point that I was making was that low-income minority children have higher levels of exposure, and when their blood has been tested, they have higher levels of that right. chemical toxic toxicity it, in there. Thank you, and I do recognize also that you mentioned another concern of uh, an inability beca because of economic conditions of being able to buy oneself out by uh, being able to make price purchases for green right. products. So I recognize your testimony there as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now excuse this panel and move to panel number four. Thank you. We're now going to proceed to panel four. Uh, judging by some of the body language I've observed, you're raring to go, <laughs> and you have a number of comments, and we certainly appreciate your attendance, and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, we have Mr. Robert Simon from the American Chemistry Council and the North American Flame Retardant Alliance, Mr. Michael Walls from the American Chemistry Council, Dr. Matthew Blaze, Southwestern Research Institute, Dr. Thomas Osimitz, Osimitz um, from Science Strategies, Mr. Chris Fleet, Information Technology Industry Council and the Consumer Technology Association and Mr. Timothy Riley from Clarion Corporation. And we welcome you all. Mr. Simon. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Robert J. Simon. I'm here today representing the American Chemistry Council and its North American Flame Retardant Alliance. Uh, the NAFRA member companies are, are the primary producers of flame retardants, including, but not limited to, organohalogen flame retardants. Um, the NAFRA member companies produ are, produce a range of products that are designed to enhance fire performance of various end uses, including both commercial and industrial. And they're committed to both a, you know, a strong and transparent regulatory system that provides both, and I think we heard this from, from Commissioner Kaye's, strong fire protection as well as safety, chemical safety. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Also wanted to say thank you to the commissioners for taking time last month. We tried to come in and give a little bit of briefing about our industry, so we appreciate your time. Uh, I'm speaking today in opposition to the petition uh, because of its overly broad nature as well as its potential impact to reduce or undermine fire safety. Um, I'm trying to I'm going to try and tailor my remarks a little bit to some of the discussion that's already happened this morning, but I'd like to emphasize basically three key points. So first, as, as the CPSC well knows, fire safety is a critical factor to consider, particularly for this petition. And as part of that, flame retardants are an important part of the overall fire protection measures that are put in place. Um, the good news is that fires have dropped dramatically since the 70s, uh, and that is a, that's, a, that's directly as a result of a comprehensive set of fire protection measures, including flame retardants, that have been put in place. And in some cases, the CPSC is led in that regard. At the same time, fire represents a real ongoing challenge. Fire, fire, fires and departments um, respond to a fire every 25 seconds in the U.S. And as the CPSC has recognized in its uh, most recent chairman's challenge, you know, just on an annual basis, over 2,000 fire deaths, over 13,000 fire injuries, over six billion in fire damages. So while fire safety, we've made progress, it's still a real issue. Um, and the CPSC's own recall data reinforces this. In the last several years, there's been over 7,000 product recalls as it relates to fire hazard, including the product categories that are identified in the petition. Um, and just, I would note yesterday, there was another product recall as it related to electronics and furniture, so sort of a timely issue. 
But the reality is, is that the changing nature of our consumer products uh, has increased fire safety risk. We have a lot more synthetic products in our homes and that we use, and on their own, those synthetic materials are more flammable, and that's why we have these fire safety protection measures. Uh, flame retardants have been proven to be effective in helping not only prevent fires, but also where there is a fire, slowing the rate of that fire progression, which gives both consumers and our families more time to escape, but also for firefighters to get to a fire and help respond. So bottom line is fire safety is a critical factor and I encourage you to think about this as you evaluate this petition. Second key point I want to make, flame retardants include a broad range of substances and the petition outlines a broad range of substances that would be covered. These have different properties, different structures, different uses. There was a lot of discussion this morning about the differences and the similarities. I think I just want to emphasize these are very different substances. And while I understand the petitioners have tried to narrow or at least clarify the original intent of the scope of the petition, if you just look at the 25 substances that were referenced in their, uh, in the initial petition, some are solid, some are liquids, some are volatile, some are non-volatile, um, some are soluble, some are non-soluble, so very different. And I just want to emphasize that point. And the reason they're different is that you use different flame retardants for different materials. Something in electronic casing is going to be very different than, say, the foam in your, in your furniture. So there's a reason for those differences. But this petition ignores those differences and would ban a broad range of products, including those that have been determined to be safe for their intended use and do not present a risk, and as well as substances that haven't even been invented yet. And the third point I'll just close with is that, you know, again, our, from our perspective, the petition is overly broad. It has the potential to undermine fire safety and does not set forth sufficient facts to ban these substances under the FHSA. Um, I've already stated some of the comments with regards to why it's broad, also why it has the potential to undermine fire safety, but I'll just focus on the, the last issue, which is a lot of the claims in the petition tend to focus on hazard. And just, you know, there's really no consideration of the actual risk that might be presented. And that's important for two reasons. One is that's a potential requirement is evaluating these under the FHSA. But I'm just going to use one case study. So TBBPA is one of the flame retardants that is potentially covered underneath this petition. It has both additive and reactive applications. Uh, most recent comprehensive study showed that that chemical is 7 million times below the established safety and health margins for, a sub, for, for that chemical. And then on top of that, it's been reviewed by multiple government agencies, including comprehensive reviews by the European Union, by Canada, that have determined that substances not present uh, a potential adverse risk to human health or the environment. So in this case, we'd be adopting a petition that would ban a substance that has been approved by other government agencies and does not present a risk to human health or in the environment. And that's a question is why would, why would the CPSC choose to take that action? So that's an example. There's a lot of flame retardants that are covered. I'll end there and I just would emphasize that again, we support a very strong and transparent regulatory system. Um, we don't think that the petition meets the standard and encourage the, the CPSC to uh, deny that petition. Thank, Thank you me. so much for your testimony, Mr. Wallace. Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Michael Walls. I'm the Vice President of Regulatory and Technical Affairs at the American Chemistry Council, and I'm here basically to, uh, to also support the comments of my colleague, Rob Simon. Um, ACC overall represents the leading companies in the business of chemistry. Um, we, w our members apply the science of chemistry to make people's lives better, healthier, and safer. And, and safety and, and and health has been important drivers for our for our industry um, in, in developing new products and bringing them to market. Now, we appreciate the opportunity to to present the, these comments to you, and we want to ensure assure you of our um, uh, of our interest in working with you uh, to provide additional information as you consider this petition. Uh, I'm here to oppose the petition uh, uh, before you today, uh, and I'd like to focus on two major points. First, that the substances that are under review have already been or are currently undergoing a review for their safety by the Environmental Protection Agency under what we consider to be a fairly comprehensive regulatory system. That work at EPA is very relevant to your decision on this petition, and we'd strongly encourage you to look for an opportunity to consult with the EPA on this. Clearly, the CPSC has a uh, as a role in regulating consumer products, but this petition would have you duplicating work at EPA. Um, uh, 
you know, flame retardants uh, th that are on the market are, like many other chemicals, subject to the, to to the Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, as well as um, other regulatory systems. Now, TSCA confers broad authority on EPA to, to regulate chemicals, including all of the uses cited under the petition. In addition, TSCA confers specific authority to EPA to consider categories of classes of chemicals for regulation. It does not, the agency does not have to take an individual chemical by chemical uh, approach to regulation. Um, in, in addition, EPA has developed, um, in regulating these substances, has developed um, considerable expertise in toxicology, exposure assessment, and risk assessment. To, to address unreasonable risks posed by, by chemicals, and we believe that that expertise is, again, relevant here. Um, in terms of uh, new chemicals that are coming on the market, EPA has considerable authority in reviewing new chemical substances, uh, and in fact, EPA can prohibit new, new substances coming onto the market for their use in particular products, uh, has a wide range of regulatory authority. With respect to existing chemicals, it's certainly true that the agency has been, the EPA has been criticized in terms of its implementation of the Toxic Substances Control Act. But nonetheless, beginning in March of 2012, EPA actually began to exercise its authority to prioritize existing chemicals on the market and begin review of those substances for their um, potential toxicity and, and potential regulatory needs. It's called the Work Plan for Chemical Assessments. Um, it currently has 90 chemicals uh, on that list. Of that 90, uh, flame retardants was a particular class that was singled out by EPA for a particular review. Of the 70 chem uh, flame retardants that EPA reviewed, they've apparently, they have said um, that uh, uh, approximately 50 of those are unlikely to pose a risk to human health. Um, for the remaining 20, those assessments uh, are, are underway. Um, we think that that information is particularly important um, for the Commission as you consider the most current scientific information that's applicable to these substances, the efficient use of resources here at the Commission, and the avoidance of duplication with, with the work of other agencies. The second point I'd like to make is that this petition um, is, is overbroad. It's a troubling application of the FHSA in our view and should be rejected. Um, we believe the petition doesn't meet the criteria outlined in the act um, and specifically that it tends to ignore the complexities of product evaluations. Whether a product's harmful depends on multiple factors including the, the ingredients themselves, how those chemicals might be integrated into the product, the actual exposure levels arising from them. So the mere presence of a chemical substance seems to be the focus of, of this petition rather than the actual risk. Um, and this is not a scientifically accurate uh, uh, approach to regulating these substances. So uh, in, in our view, the petition doesn't meet the standards established by the FHSA. We appreciate your time, and ha we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Blaise. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you, Commissioners. Um, I'm also opposed to the rule, and I have a presentation, and I'm going to present a few fire facts. I run a fire research laboratory. Uh, we do between three and 4,000 fire tests a year looking at materials reaction to fire. What that means is we look at the propensity to ignite, how much energy they release as they burn, how fast it releases it, and how much toxic smoke is emitted as a result of that. And we do, again, almost 4,000 of those tests a year. Can we go to the third slide, please? Next one, please. Some basic fire facts. I, the, the three, uh, the third, fourth, and fifth bullets there under the first line. Uh, the leading cause of accidental death, uh, the fourth leading cause of accidental death in ages four, one to four uh, is fire for children. Uh, these are 2013 statistics. About 129 children died in, in 2013 in that age group. Five to nine, it's the third leading cause. Uh, and again, that's only 87 deaths, but it's still a significant number. The really startling number is it's the seventh leading cause of death for uh, ages 65 and over. And we're talking more than 1,100 de deaths a year related to fire injury. So it's a significant killer of the elderly. Next slide, please. Um, fire safety is best when it's layered. Uh, we test sprinklers on a routine basis. Even sprinkler systems can't suppress all fires. 
we did a, a test where we were looking at commodity storage of uh, cell phone fluids in polyethylene tote containers stacked three high. Uh, and we designed the test to withstand the fluid inside the containers, but ignored the polymers that made up the casing of the, the container. And one of them drained, and the fire got so large the suppression system couldn't handle it. So to say that a single layer of fire protection is adequate is probably an inaccurate statement. You need multiple layers. Uh, looking at Cal TB 117, the 2013 standard, um, it talks about fire barriers as being an optimal type of barrier and that the smolder only standard is adequate to test the materials. We've done a series of tests on furniture and we found that a fire barrier is a great thing. But if it's over a foam that's uh, highly ignitable and releases lots of energy, it will burn at better than a megawatt heat release rate, which will ignite a room, reach flashover, and cause mass death. So it's important to have layers of fire protection, whether it's layers within the furniture that's being designed or layers within the house itself. Um, next slide, please. As a couple of panelists have said already, the use of polymers in the home has increased the fuel load in homes today. Polymers have tremendous heat content. The human body stores fat. That is basically a polymer. It's a hydrocarbon. Um, the reason it does that, it's the most efficient energy storage system there is. And as a result, it releases that energy rapidly when combustion occurs. So it, it's pretty important to understand that when you're dealing with polymers, the, the heat load in a home is huge compared to what it was in the 60s. In addition, you have batteries in everything today. So there's plenty of ignition sources out there that could potentially ignite those polymers, whether the cases or not. Next slide, please. We'll skip over this. Next slide, I only have five minutes. There's only so much I can cover. Fire retardants mode of action, they prevent ignition of materials from small ignition open flame sources. They slow the rate of fire growth, and they reduce the overall peak heat release rate. That reduces the impact of a fire. Next slide, please. This is what's important here. These are two television sets that we tested as a part of a larger study. We used a 500-watt ignition source with a two-minute exposure. Uh, what you're seeing is a time-lapsed a video of the effect of that. When you remove the uh, ignition source, you can see that the other TV with the fire retardants in it on the right barely burns, while the one on the left with no fire retardants, which does not come from a U.S. market, this one's actually from Brazil, uh, burns rapidly. So without fire retardants in the casing material, you get a fairly large fire, which can spread and cause a larger fire in the home. So obviously there's a lot more safety in the one on the right-hand side. And um, the peak heat release rates are pretty significant. We get up to uh, a half a megawatt of total energy release from a 30-inch television. That's not a large television in today's market. The larger the surface area, the larger the heat release rate is going to be. Next slide, please. Go next slide, please. The problem with showing fire retardants add value is you're proving a negative. If a fire never happens, you can't say there's a benefit because it, you, you're not recording it. There's no data to support that. But we know they work from our testing in the laboratory. When you test it against standardized testing, we find all the time that fire retardant materials end up having longer time to ignition, lower peak heat release rate. Um, overall, they're more fire resistant. And as a result of that, they're safer in our homes. And that's, I guess, my last slide. So. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Osimitz. Thank you for Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, I'm coming to you as a toxicologist with a doctorate degree in toxicology. I'm board certified in toxicology in the U.S. and also in the European Union. And I've got over 30 years of experience looking at uh, hazard exposure and risk to a variety of different chemicals. I work at a company called Science Strategies. I'm principal scientist. I'm here as an independent scientist, but I have to add as well, I chair the Science Advisory Council for the North American Flame Retardant Alliance. And the SAC has members from the toxicology community like myself and members from the fire safety community as well. So I'm fairly familiar with this, this set of chemistry. Really, two points I want to make regarding the petition, and it's, it's tailored, I've tailored just a little bit to what I heard this morning. Probably the most concerning is the idea of grouping all these chemicals together. And as someone who's looked in detail at the various hazard assessments and the risk assessments that have been conducted on them, they are not the same. I can give several examples. The written testimony has a couple of them in more, more uh, detail than I'll do here. But TCPP is one example. Um, and I know the nomenclature can get pretty complicated with TCPP, TCE, PDCPP, et cetera. But TCPP, 
although it's structurally related to these other molecules, some of which do have problematic properties, TCPP is not considered neurotoxic. It's not toxic to the reproductive system. It's not classified as a carcinogen, mutagen, and reproductive toxicant. So when you see in the petitioner, you hear people say something to the extent that human exposure to all studied flame organohalogen flame retardants is associated with long-term chronic health effects. It isn't true for all the molecules. And a careful look at the data that are available publicly and available the, the data that the EPA has used in their assessments, especially through the design um, for the environment, the DFE program, you'll, you'll note that. Um, the other point I think it's important to stress is considering exposure and risk. Um, that's often a difficult subject because estimating exposure can be problematic depending on the population you have, but it's essential because we know that every day we're exposed to many chemicals which are hazardous when they're tested in toxicology laboratories. But we use those chemicals safely, our body can handle them, et cetera. Not all chemicals operate that way, but it really does need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Simon mentioned the assessments that have been done in the European Union. The European Union, as well as Environment Canada, has looked carefully at TBBPA and found the uses there posing no risk to humans or the environment. And most recently, and I think this is probably one of the more informative reports, uh, uh, I cite this in the uh, submission, Colnott et al. did a comprehensive assessment of exposure um, as well, and they included dust exposure. You've heard about that this morning, which is something you really do need to take a look at. It's a legitimate uh, concern about exposure to chemicals and dust, but you do need to put it in perspective as to how much dust people actually get. And even when you factor in exposure to children, you'll see that there's large margins of safety that would be acceptable by most standards in the United States and also in the European Union. And I refer to you to that report, and you'll see that there actually has been an awful lot of work considering all the types of exposures. Um, Back to TCPP, the European Union completed a 400-page risk assessment, and this was com completed in, back in 2009 and then um, reviewed again by uh, DG Sanko, one of the European Union agencies, in 2011 and found to be credible. Um, two other important points when we talk about exposure. Um, the idea that you can have safe exposures is something, again, that needs to be considered, and this is something that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis and to some extent a use-by-use -use basis, and it has to be different for adults versus children. So those are very important points. Um, I'll close here in a moment, but I urge you to take a look at the organohalogens as a class of molecules that are similar structurally, but the structural similarities do not necessarily translate into hazard nor potential for exposure. So by looking at the carefully, the work that's been published, and additionally, the work that's available through the uh, authoritative regulatory bodies, I think you'll see that. So in, in conclusion, uh, I urge you to take a look at them individually. Uh, and second of all, please take a look at exposure and risk, and you can come up with priorities. There's been questions about how do you prioritize. It's very difficult when you have all the chemicals in the environment and products. And as someone who was in the consumer product uh, industry for 15 years at SC Johnson, we had to do that all the time. But what we did is we prioritized. We prioritized based on exposure and ultimately on risk. And I think that works pretty well. So I'd recommend you consider that. Thank, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, is it uh, Dr. Cleet? No, Mr. Cleet. Okay. Thanks. The technology and industry sectors are presented by the uh, Information Technology Industry Council and the Consumer Technology Association. Thank the Commission for the opportunity to provide comments on petition requesting a rulemaking on products containing additive organohalogen flame retardants. My name is Chris Cleet and I'm the Director of Environment and Sustainability at ITI. My background is in chemistry and environmental science and I've been working on materials, product stewardship and sustainability issues for the technology and electronic sectors for over 10 years. I'm testifying today on behalf of both associations, ITI and CTA, and we're the manufacturers of electronic devices, a, a whole bunch of them that we list in our written comments uh, that are mentioned in the petition. Our member companies have long been recognized for their commitment in leadership and innovation sustainability, taking measures to exceed regulatory requirements in environmental design, energy efficiency, product stewardship, which includes, of course, consumer safety. Given our shared goals and commitment to consumer safety and our scientific and technical expertise, experience in product safety, we respectfully request that the Commission deny this petition and opt not to initiate a rulemaking. In my testimony, we discuss how the petition before you is overly broad, insufficiently justified, and its goals are already being met through numerous other voluntary and government initiatives. 
Because of this, the action proposed is unneeded, unnecessarily expansive, and could do more harm than good. The CPSIA includes a comprehensive certification requirements for banned materials. A rule banning OFRs and electronic products will impo uh, impose unprecedented regulatory, cha regulatory challenges with no clear link to consumer benefit or safety. The electronic sectors support continuing participation in existing and proven industry and government-led initiatives which provide methods to reduce the use of OFRs while maintaining product integrity and enhancing consumer safety. Consumer safety has always been our top priority. It's a moral imperative, and it's essential to the trust of our customers. The technology and electronic centers have been voluntarily phasing out a lot of OFRs in electronic devices for years, when and where the technology, science, and advances in new materials support these changes. For example, our sectors phased out the use of OctaBDE decades ago, and we're phasing out the very few remaining uses of DecaPDE. That said, it's important to recognize that flame retardants are essential for consumer safety. One industry effort, uh, the IEEE 1680 family of standards, uh, they're also related to the EPEAT uh, green purchasing program, have incentivized manufacturers to remove additive brominated and chlorinated flame retardants from the products covered in these standards. There are many other industry efforts underway that we detail further in our written comments. As part of our sector's continuing commitment to the environment, our companies continually reassess the use of all materials in our products. Substances used in electronic <laughs> products have been selected due to their unique physical and chemical properties. We work to substitute when these, could pose, when these could pose concerns, and once we identify compounds that are suitable and effective to use, we, we replace them. Improved techniques and technologies available today enable to accurately evaluate potential human health effects of chemicals and their use and help manufacturers select the best chemicals and substances to minimize the potential for introduction of regrettable substances. We believe applying these measured and data-based approaches rather than imposing a one-size-fits-all ban is the proper way to reduce some of the issues related to some OFRs. Potential fire hazards in high tech and electronics are routinely managed using well established best design practices and appro appropriate material selections. The product standards prescribe the appropriate level of flame resistance in accordance with how the materials are used and how the product operates. So while the use of flame retardant compounds is not required by any national law or regulation, there are very stringent fire safety law specifications and standards for electronics. The outright ban of these chemicals will have the unattended consequences of altering the proven approach that has long ensured the fire safety of electronic products. If OFRs are banned as an entire class, the path forward for new products will be very unclear. In summary, I'd like to thank the Commission again for the opportunity to provide comments today. ITI and CTA believe that the petition being considered is overly broad, fails to justify the need for the Commission to initiate a rulemaking. Uh, both myself and Allison Shoemaker, she's in the other room, uh, we're happy to answer any further questions. And as I said before, we'll be submitting detailed written comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Riley. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Riley. I have a technical marketing position involving flame retardants at Clariant Corporation. Clariant is a Swiss-based global specialty chemical company with 17,000 employees, including 2,000 here in North America. Clariant manufactures halogen-free phosphorus-based flame retardants, which are used in different plastics, coatings, and adhesives. Our products are widely used in green consumer electronic products such as laptops, handheld devices, and other electrical equipment. The environmental and hazard profile of these products are in the public domain, such as the U.S. EPA Design for the Environment Alternatives Assessment. Today, the focus of my comments relate to meeting fire safety requirements with an improved environmental health and safety profile. It is possible to maintain a high level of fire safety while simultaneously protecting human health and the environment. These two requirements can coexist. I will now provide several examples where industry has provided viable technical solutions in, North, in the North American market concerning the replacement of certain organohalogens. 
Example one, furniture, polyurethane foam to meet California TB117, 1975. A reactive halogen-free flame retardant can be used in this commercial application to meet the open flame test. The flame retardant becomes bound in part of the polyurethane. There is no migration of flame retardant, therefore no exposure. Example two, interior automotive. Polyurethane foam to meet federal standard FMVSS302. TDCP has been used in interior automotive applications such as headliners and seating. A halogen-free reactive flame retardant can be used to pass this same test. Again, the flame retardant becomes bound into the polyurethane structure and does not migrate. Example three, building and construction. Polyisocyanurate roofing board insulation to meet UL Class A. Currently, many thousands of tons of the organohalogen TCPP are used for insulation in buildings throughout North America. A commercial technical solution now exists using a reactive halogen-free flame retardant. The Johns Manville Company won a Green Building Award during 2014 with this first-to-market halogen-free insulation board. TCPP can be replaced in this application. Example four, building and construction, rigid polystyrene foam thermal installation to meet ASTM E84. Historically, thousands of tons of the organohalogen HBCD has been used for the building and construction application. The Dow Chemical Company has invented a new brominated polymeric molecule and has licensed three different flame retardant companies to produce and sell this product. Due to its molecular size, this additive flame retardant does not migrate. HBCD can now be replaced in this application. Example five, DECA BDE replacement in electronics uh, housings and other applications to meet UL94 and other tests. If an OEM manufacturer chooses either the pol polymer alloy PCABS or PPE HIPS for the electronic enclosure, then halogen-free solutions are possible. One final example, mattresses, polyurethane foam to meet 16 CFR uh, 1633 and California TB129. There has been some recent work done as part of a joint industry academia government project using commercially available halogen free flame returns to meet the mattress fire test. The goal is commercialization of a migration free solution for polyurethane mattresses. And so far the results look quite promising and the work continues. My conclusion. Uh, fire safety in consumer products should be maintained either, either by the use of alternative flame retardant chemicals or inherently fire retardant materials. We urge the CPSC to consider alternative technologies in any future rulemaking. This will keep the door open for continued R&D investment and innovation by our industry. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, I see we have six panelists, so we're going to try to ask our questions crisply. Uh, and Mr. Simon uh, and uh, Mr. Walls uh, and other members of the panel mentioned that you think the petition is overly broad. Now, one of the abilities of the commission is to grant a petition fully, grant it in part, uh, or deny it. And so I guess the question is, when you're saying that it's overly broad, are you, in effect, asserting that we should not pay any attention to these uh, non-polymeric uh, organic uh, orga <laughs> organohalogens that are intentionally added to uh, consumer products? So from, a, from an association perspective that operates under antitrust law, it's hard for us to speak to specifics in the marketplace. But I think what to your question, it's more about what might be done here. So our, our, I guess our feedback to the CPSC would be is deny the petition. It's overly broad. Let's identify those substances if there are those that do you know, present a risk and would be consistent with the standards under the FHSA and then have the CPSC initiate rulemaking on those, you know, those substances in those applications that really present a risk. 
And I think that would be our feedback. Uh, Mr. Simon, you have been here explaining why they don't present a risk. I'm assuming that the, uh, that the industry has done risk assessments on its own. Are you unable to share those risk assessments with us? No, have to, and in fact, mention some of those today, and we'll definitely share that, and we'll also provide that as part of our comments. I think I was trying to just be responsive to your questions of, are there, th you know, to the extent are there things that should be focused on? I think there are substances that are out there, and you heard a little bit about those from today, but again, our view would be is any regulation should focus on those that present a risk and not, you know, just not based on mere presence and uh, take into account those factors. So that Thank you. Mr. Walls? I would only add, Commissioner, that uh, we think that there's a need to distinguish between those individual substances, right? So I think the problem here is that it's so, the petition is so sweeping that you haven't had an opportunity to really understand, well, are these substances different? Do they have different characteristics um, as they're applied in these product groupings? That's uh, the, the basis for our recommendation that you consult with the Environmental Protection Agency to understand which of those 70 flame retardants that they looked at are potentially covered by this petition and which might um, which might which of those might fall into that group of 50 for example that the that the agency has already concluded are safe for their uses yeah and about that 50 I did want to ask you a specific question how many of those 50 are non polymeric organohalogen flame retardants in additive form that's an excellent question um, unfortunately the agency hasn't re uh, hasn't released the cast numbers the chemical abstract service numbers relevant to those substances so I cannot answer that specifically but we'll try and get you that I'd, I'd really appreciate it. And I guess the other question I would have is uh, when you look at the pharmaceutical industry, they have moved towards publishing uh, all studies that have been done, including those that are inconclusive and those that, are, that demonstrate the safety and efficacy of their product. To your knowledge, uh, is there a set of studies done by the industry, known to them, not known to us, unpublished, that would have direct bearing on this issue? It's to your knowledge. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess the, to answer your question, you know, from an ACC perspective, when our groups do a study, we make that available. And I mean, that's okay. part of our policy. Now, I can't speak to every company in terms of how everything's been in, done, but that there are also requirements under law, under TSCA, to, you know, make information available if you determine that there are health and environmental effects. So I think there's both regulatory and um, company policies there. And just to quickly add to that, Commissioner, the Toxic Substances Control Act doesn't require... Uh, negative studies to be submitted to the agency, of course. So it's only studies that have, where there's been a determination that there's a health or safety impact that, that they're submitted. So there may, in fact, be information on these substances as well as others that are, that are not otherwise, have not otherwise been made available. Uh, I only have one minute, but I would like to throw o open this question to the others. You've heard the concern about this concept called regrettable substitution, and I was wondering if any of you would care to make a very, very quick observation about it in the minute that I have remaining. And Dr. Osmitz, it looks like you I do. can do fairly quickly. Um, I sure understand the concept, and it's something you do want to avoid. Many of the regrettable substitutions in the past occurred in a different era, a different era, I think, of how toxicology testing was done, how regulatory agencies performed. Since many of those regrettable substitutions that you heard about earlier today, and some of them I would agree with, not all of them I, I would think I would agree with, but on the other hand, there's a much more comprehensive testing by industry. The risk assessments have been done in the European Union and the um, Environment Canada give me a lot of confidence that there's a lot more science being produced on all these molecules than there would have been 10 or 15 years ago. Thank you very much. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Um, when In looking at this petition and what we're being asked to do, it's been very, very important to my analysis that I really, really focus on the limits of the petition. And I confess to being enormously frustrated with the people who are opposing this petition that those same specifics have not been part of the presentations, either written or oral. So I'm hoping in my five minutes to do a little bit on that. These are non-polymeric additive organohalogen flame retardants in four product areas. That's it. And so when we hear things, for example, from you, Mr. Simon, about TBBPA, which we know is used in a reactive form, not an additive form, that's not helpful. Mr. Blaze, it's not helpful when you, we see the innards of a TV burning when we're not talking about the innards of a TV. Nobody's asking that we ban them there. They're asking for the casings only, and we know that in Europe they don't have flame retardants in the casings, and they have exponentially fewer fires that involve casings than we do in the United States. So I'm just hoping, in, in response to my 
questions, we can limit this to what the petition's asking for. So let me ask any of you, do any of you know of, and I'm, I'm focusing on the scientific grouping of these particular chemicals and when it is appropriate for the structural differences that would reach a different endpoint to be something that we should be considering so that we would say it's not appropriate to lump these together. So let me ask it specifically, do any of you know of a non-organic additive organohalogen fire retardant, flame retardant, that is structurally different enough from others in that category to bring about a different endpoint in terms of the toxic effect? And Commissioner, I can understand your frustration. I guess what I'd just like to emphasize, in the case that I used of the example with TBBPA, it is used in additive applications. And Very rarely and only in really recent times. The only studies we have are reactive form inside electronics primarily. Okay. Well, I just, I, again, it, it may not meet your needs, but I think that was the example we were using as one that would be covered under this, that is used in an additive way, and when done a risk assessment did not present a risk to human health and the environment. So what it would so do those... is it would limit it in additive form, not a reactive form. By definition of the petition, right? Correct? But those, but those, it would still be included, and it would be one of those that would be restricted, okay. despite the fact that it's been determined to be, you know, not present a risk. And okay. that's that was could the point we, I was just trying to. Could get we just so. try my question? Are you aware of any any chemicals without me that go, fall in this category that are structurally different enough that they would result in a different endpoint? So we should exclude those from the grouping. Okay. Um, let me try. Com <laughs> Commissioner. You can, you can answer this later, too. I mean, I've got yeah. five minutes, but if you've got it quickly, fine. One, Otherwise one quick correction. That was a casing fire on the television. The one that I showed in the video, that was the casing that was burning, not the interior. Oh, that certainly looked like an interior with what we were watching. No, it was the back panel, the plastics of the casing. Okay, thank you. Um, but let me ask you this, um, Mr. Walls. You do understand that the, we're un the EPA and the CPSC operate on completely different statutes, under completely different statutes. And you understand that the EPA is looking at industrial chemicals and we're looking at chemicals in consumer products. And for this petition, specifically four categories of consumer products, right? Yes, Commissioner. Okay. And when you told us it, that 50 of them had been found to be no threat to human health, again, they may not even be in this grouping because you just don't know. Right? I think, Commissioner, that it's important to find that out. Um, EPA but, clearly but under TOSCA has the, uh, has the authority to reach articles, even consumer products. So. My, my question is specifically, do you know because that's what no, we I need don't. to No, I don't. I did respond okay. that way. Um, so the... the um, Dr. Osimitz, in terms of this grouping that you're troubled by, because I think anybody looking at the petition, even Dr. Birnbaum this morning said when you first look at it, you think this seems to be really um, expansive in terms of the grouping. But again, I get back to the scientific explanation of groupings, appropriate groupings for regulatory purposes. And what is it about this grouping that's not appropriate in terms of structural differences that change the endpoints? Well, first, I think there's two points. One, if you have no information at all, and we've got a new set of molecules never seen before by humankind, you want to do grouping and you want to do structure activity relationships and you maybe take a couple of chemicals to represent the whole class. That's completely appropriate. It's good science. But in the case here, and I can follow up with some specifics, where you have actual toxicology studies, in some cases, Dozens of toxicology studies have been conducted on similar molecules within that are relatively similar, but they have different results. You really do have to look at the results. So even though the structures may be relatively similar, you do have to, you know, real data should trump a, a model assumption. And when you're talking about molecules, there are also differences mm -hmm. between the non-polymeric and the polymeric, right? That's true. Okay. My time's up. Darn it. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a series of questions, and if I can't get to them all, I will do QFRs, and I'll follow up with some questions. And so with regards to that, if you could keep your answers short and crisp, I'd really appreciate it. Um, number one, I don't know if you heard the first panel. One of my questions is, can we prioritize those 83 chemicals? Um, and so I guess I'd ask that question. Is there a way to prioritize the chemicals in terms of risk? and exp exposure. 
Uh, Commissioner, I think one place to start would be the prioritization process that EPA has applied in its work plan chemical process. It looks at a number of factors. Um, again, it's not making a conclusion about their risk at that point. It's it's a prioritization screening process, but I think that has the type of elements that we could commend to you for consideration. Thank you. Um, is there data um, with regards to what FRs, what flame retardants, what are these? What are these chemicals are used in each of the four categories? You don't need to be specific, but just is there data available that you can provide to me, to us? takes the, the FRs or the chemicals and applies them to each of the four categories. So we know what, what we're talking about rather than this broad. I'm trying to break this down. I've heard you know, from all of you that this is overly broad and I'm trying to understand a way for a non-scientist to approach this issue. We, we, per, we plan to provide that data in our written comments so we can definitely do that. Okay. And one of our prioritization issues as well is looking at the chemicals that haven't been already removed. So one of the points I made is that we've got this long process of evaluating individual chemicals and removing them where it makes sense. Uh, so putting regulatory restrictions on things that have already been that, that have already basically happened uh, could be a, a good way to prioritize. Thank you, Mr. Simon. And I, I would just say we'll also pr uh, provide that information and uh, along those lines as well as try and outline why some of those aren't interchangeable. I think that's an important thing we were trying to emphasize is that you just can't mix these and that's, that's, but that's important to know because that will help with that. Thank you. Any one of you can answer this, but I'll address it to Mr. Walls. Do you think that uh, in your opinion we would need to convene a chap to, to get to, uh, into this inquiry? Um, Commissioner, to tell you the truth, I haven't really thought of, of that approach. Uh, not uh, really competent to respond to that right now. Is anyone else uh, interested in responding to that, Mr. Simon? I would just say maybe given what Mr. Wall said is that because there are some ongoing work at US EPA, I think a lot of that work has been done and we can look there as part of that information. I know there's been ongoing exchanges between the CPSC and EPA and I think that would be a good place to start. That, uh, and I know it's not directly responsive to your question, but maybe Commissioner Robinson, I think another point would be is as Mike said, there's a, there's a prioritization tool in place by EPA to look at flame retardants. As they looked at this class of chemicals, they recognized they couldn't group all of these together. And so for the priorities that they have identified, they've looked at at least four different groupings. And I'm not saying those groupings are right, but I think there is some recognition that there are some different endpoints and you need to look at these different uses even within that broad class of chemistry. And so, again, that might be a place to look to, to help prioritize. I can't see how much time I have left, Todd. I have two quick questions. Okay, good. Uh, a minute apiece. Um, Dr. Blaze, you've heard this morning that uh, flame retardants don't work. Could you speak to that? And you have now 50 seconds. <laughs> <coughs> it's pretty easy. They do work. It's a measurable fact. It's a function of how big the ignition source applied to the material is will obscure whether they work or not. A really large ignition source will hide the fact that they retard flame retardant or the flame growth. Um, it, anything that you put in a really big fire is going to burn. Uh, that's just a fact. Um, but the point is that materials don't become the first item ignited and contribute to the growth of the fire. And that's where fire retardants really add value. And uh, to any one of you, I've heard throughout the course of your testimony this morning that um, they are different chemicals with different effects and they need to be looked at separately. I've heard uh, adults versus children. I've heard uh, carcinogenic versus some of the uh, other issues that have been identified, whether it's a, a endocrine disruptor. Or, is that a way to look at these chemicals? And I know I recognize you've mentioned the EPA and how they are looking at this, but is that a way um, that we look at endpoints and we <coughs> distinguish and uh, separate them, them out that way? I can comment on that, um, Commissioner. With regard to endpoints, what you mentioned are hazard endpoints, and that's an important step to start with. But the next piece that has to go on it really is exposure, because there are a number of chemicals for which you would be less concerned about the hazard if there's essentially minor or no exposure. But on the other hand, you could have lesser of a hazard, but if there's a greater exposure, that would be something that you'd come back to, and then it, so it gets under risk. And that's you have to start with a hazard because you're trying to estimate the probability of some hazard occurring. So you would want to at least start with categories of hazards. Hazard and then exposure and mm -hmm. risk. I and then the hazard will, will normalize everything so you can compare relative risk between the different hazards. 
Thank you all very much. Uh, my time has expired. Thank Commissioner you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel for their testimony. And it's good to see you again, Tom, old friend. Talking about cast numbers, it's like a walk down <laughs> memory lane here. Um, I do want to talk about the um, the the way the petitioners have have organized their their recommendation to ban uh, on a class basis. Commissioner Robinson got to this, and I'll eventually want to make my way back around to TBBPA. So, for the based on the petitioner's recommendation. Um, the, the, the product would be a banned hazardous substance if it included an organohalogen with two qualifiers, right? One that's additive and one that is non-polymeric. And I asked Dr. Birnbaum this morning whether or not TBBPA was now or being seen to be being used in the casings of electronics as I was distinguishing between the interior componentry. And she said, yes, it's emerging as a flame retardant alternative. So TBBPA has been studied by governments and determined to be uh, safe. And if you could briefly, what, what governments have studied TBBPA? Oh, I'm sorry, but Mr. Simon, Mr. Walls, because you, you were focusing on, I beg your pardon. Yeah, no, and, and we'll provide this in our comments as well, but the specific ones that I would point to are recent, recent determinations both by the European Union underneath um, uh, its regulations as well as by Canada, both Environment and Health Canada that came to similar conclusions. It is also being evaluated, or I should say reevaluated by EPA as part of its priorities. And so all three of those would be relevant and things that I think would be um, important to consider. Earlier today, I, I mentioned my, uh, my curiosity with hexabromocyclodotacane. How did I do, Tom? All right, thanks. And I was curious how they were rendered by CPSC and NRC to be and Dr. Uh, to be safe for upholstered furniture for some rulemaking we were doing there. Dr. Bernbrown explained to me, but that was qualified specifically with an exposure pathway with dermal exposure. Um, with regards to TBBPA, was the uh, the end conclusion that TBBPA is safe for use or whatever their con conclusion of safe and how they qualified it, was it with a specific exposure pathway that doesn't include some of the exposure pathways that have been identified in this testimony and future testimony? No, and, and Dr. Simon. Dr. Osmus might raise this as well, but I think it varies by agency. So I think the EU did not necessarily look at all of the exposure routes, but other agencies have. And the data that I had referenced, and which we'll be including in our comments, the 7 million times below safety margins, yep. that included all exposure routes, including dust. And so I think it is important to look at all those exposure routes. I think it's varied by government agency in terms of how they've looked at that. Thank but you, Tom. Yeah, I would agree with that. Also, add, I believe EPA is doing that very carefully as well, looking at all exposure routes. Yeah. Um, the approach that's suggested here, and I think Commissioner uh, Burkle brought this up in looking at a contrast with uh, phthalates, and in the phthalates situation, we're not saying that all the phthalates uh, act in the same way, and therefore we can draw conclusions from all of them. In fact, we're distinguishing between phthalates. This approach uh, from a, uh, a methodology uh, ex uh, suggests that organohalogens, non-polymeric, will act in the same way, and therefore we can ban not only what exists today, but future uh, incarnations, perhaps, of non-polymeric additive organohalogens. Uh, Tom, could you talk about a class-based approach and um, whether or not TBBPA and its rendering is as, as safe um, then kind of obviates that, uh, that approach is scientifically valid? Uh, sure, Commissioner. There's, there's two points. I go back to the question that uh, Commissioner Robinson asked. If you have no data at all, the class approach makes a lot of sense. You can do some structure activity relationships and predict some kinds of properties. But once you start accumulating millions of dollars of data for which tens of thousands of animals have been sacrificed, you start to have to use the empirical data. And if you use the empirical data, you'll see that there are members of this class, some of which to either are, have hazards which other ones don't, and TBPA is a good example, or if they have a hazard, the potency is greatly different. So the potency is how strong that effect is. That figures into my common theme of risk. Okay. So if you have data, which we do, we have a lot of knowledge of these molecules, it makes sense to use that and not step back and close your eyes and say we just don't like this category. Thanks, Tom. I apologize for being brief. I only have one minute left. Mr. Cleet. Um, in looking at, I was, uh, I'm interested in demand drivers for the incorporation of flame retardants, and the, what's been brought up here is the small open flame testing for electronics. I think it's UL94. Right. And is it generally, thank you, is it generally, um, is UL94 applicable to most consumer electronics, TVs, 
um, computers, etc. Is it very specific? It it, it is. It's it's uh, not actually. It's not very specific. Oh, it's actually part. very broad to most electronics. And so, it's referenced uh, quite often. Right. So and that's, that it, that's the safety standard that most of our products get certified to. Yeah. I beg your pardon for speaking over you. It's got to be really oh, no, quick okay. too. <laughs> but that is the demand driver for the incorporation to pass a small open flame. Yes. Has there been any recent study in terms of that being a hazard pattern? I mean, is it really a concern in terms of electronics catching on fire from small open flames? Actually, not not necessarily from open flames, but uh, the fact that we have an internal power source, that's usually our biggest driver. So the fact that we have batteries, we have power supplies, uh, there's current running through it, which could spark. So that's usually okay. where we end up looking for our safety. I apologize. My time is out, Mr. Chairman. I regret the fact that I wasn't able to ask a flame from our flame uh, expert, Dr. Blaze, uh, a question <laughs> on the record to that. Okay. Um, before I make a lunch announcement, our executive director, Patricia Atkins, would like to make an announcement. I'd just like to offer some uh, guidance as far as administratively. Um, that we will, you will see that there will be CPSC staff in the in the hallway that will be able to um, direct you, preferably to that direction. Um, and this is related to lunch as well. Um, that there are two sites um, that are locally down lo in the lobby and just out the out the door. Uh, when you return, we will ask that you go to the area where you had. Um, checked in for security, you will not have to um, go through security again. Um, but we will certainly be available to uh, escort you again up, up here. So just wanted to make sure again um, that you will have to go to the fourth floor, 4330, uh, but there are lunch areas that are nearby um, and there will be some a one pager that will give you the information about where the lunch sites are located. Okay, and with respect to lunch, uh, by my watch, not that clock, by my watch, it's uh, roughly 1224. We will take one hour for lunch, so be back roughly at 12, uh, 124. Uh, okay. And please, uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for being willing to uh, address QFRs that will be submitted.